Um, I will try to make it uh, as interactive as possible. I'd love to answer questions and kind of talk about um, your guys' experiences as you take care of a lot of this disease, um, and then talk to you about what's new, because um, there actually are new things, which is uh, really cool. So. Um, that's me. I uh, am uh, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I only see children, um, but we take care of, obviously, a ton of atopic dermatitis. I actually run an atopic dermatitis uh, immunology um, allergy clinic uh, with one of our allergists and immunologists. So I've got a lot of perspectives on atopic dermatitis that are, um, that are helpful. Uh, this slide I'm supposed to read out. So we, this is approved for one CME um, credit. Um, and then uh, you're supposed to complete an evaluation form. And uh, that's the only way you apparently receive credit. Uh, there'll be a Q&A session. That's the most fun part because you can kind of see what you're interested in. Uh, and then uh, the program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and HMP company. I can read. Um, and then this program is supported by an educational grant for Pfizer and uh, um, I, by accident, traded uh, some stock and won uh, about two months ago, so I now have a disclosure. Um, but I have nothing uh, to do with the company in any other way, um, but I uh, happen to own some stock. Um, OK, so the goal of this is really to talk about the fact that atopic dermatitis is totally different. Uh, so if you look at this talk uh, 10 years ago, we were just talking about this, uh, and you went, you went to your doctor and you said, oh, I've got eczema, people would just be like, you're not moisturizing enough. And you essentially like, tell people to like, you, you know, use more and more and more moisturizer. Um, and now we know so much more about the pathophysiology of the disease that there are many more targets and there's much more to discuss and there's much more that we can actually do for our patients. So it makes it a lot more interesting. We're going to talk about the mechanism of some of the newer drugs and some of the um, kind of safety and efficacy uh, and also talk about how um, much this disease affects people's lives. Uh, I think it's something that we weigh under treat. Um, and I think that uh, these patients can take a little bit of time, but it's really, really important that we do adequately treat them because it can be really detrimental to families. All right, so this is the important thing from my standpoint is to look at an actual human. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of um, talks that are um, basically a lot of words. And I think it's really important to kind of pull it back to the baby that you're seeing or the kid that you're seeing in the office. Um, so this is like a six-month-old, uh, and this child has not slept in six months, um, and which means mom and dad probably haven't slept in like 15 months. I've never been pregnant, but it's hard to sleep apparently at the end. Um, and the reality is that uh, um, not sleeping drives people absolutely crazy. If you go for um, a few days without sleeping, it is torture. Uh, and children who are itching all the time are not sleeping, and we need to be able to adequately treat them um, and get them better. And we'll talk about what to do for infants um, uh, and uh, how to treat them. Um, the age of onset also predicts how bad your eczema is going to be over a long period of time. So this was actually recent, uh, recently done out of Penn uh, and showed that essentially the earlier onset of your atopic dermatitis, the most likely you were to actually keep your atopic dermatitis. And I guess um, that probably speaks to somewhat of a genetic uh, component to it, where the people who have true genetic atopic dermatitis are probably the people who don't outgrow it nearly as much. Whereas if you're a four, five, six-year-old and you have some atopic dermatitis that's more related to something that you specifically did or a place that you were or humidity it, um, that you were kind of around at that time, maybe you're, you're outgrowing that because you're kind of able to treat that more easily. So early onset AD tends to um, uh, lead to uh, longer lasting AD. Um, and then this is uh, the, a paper called The Price of Paritis. So um, how many people have ever itched, ever? So like all of us, right? So you have a bug bite on your arm, and it's like really itchy, and it's annoying, and you scratch that spot, and for the five minutes that you have your bug bite, it kind of ruins your life. Um, imagine taking 30% of your body and itching 24 hours a day. Um, it is really intrusive. It's extremely hard to get around. Um, the drive to itch is extraordinarily strong. So you see parents who will be in rooms and they'll be like, oh, stop itching, or he just itches because he's like, you know, trying to get my attention, et cetera. I guarantee if you took that same parent and you just like dipped them in like itchy stuff um, and had them itch 24 hours a day, they would feel terribly also. Um, and this shows uh, not only child sleep patterns, but parents' sleep patterns. So essentially, if you have worse atopic dermatitis, um, you have uh, ch children who are sleeping sometimes uh, um, uh, or much less, and they have much more sleep disturbance. If you have um, severe atopic dermatitis, you have parents who have much more sleep disturbance. I also think if you look in families, it's, and this is anecdotal, but I think if you look in families, you often find more family strife in the family with the child who's really not sleeping very well. And again, really up to us to make sure that we're treating these families and, and patients appropriately so that we can get people sleeping more. Um, Co-sleeping happens much more in people with um, severe atopic dermatitis. Co-sleeping leads to everyone feeling worse. So like, you know, 
Oh, uh, man, we're being taped. OK, so co-sleeping is when a child is sleeping in the bed with the parents also, which leads to less, much, much less cool stuff. All right, um, so uh, flexural atopic dermatitis, uh, flexural accentuation. When you look and you're trying to decide whether someone has atopic dermatitis, you guys take care of a ton of patients. I'm sure that it's fairly obvious usually, but you kind of go back to the basics, and, and most atopic dermatitis is going to be in the flexures of the arms and the legs, the neck, the um, kind of wrist and the ankle folds in the beginning. Um, some kids in the very beginning will have some extensor atopic dermatitis. I've always wondered if that's from kind of rubbing on car seats and other kind of um, exposed areas where they can do their scratching the most easily, so they kind of tend to flare it there. But this is classic atopic dermatitis. I think the pattern of where it is is actually usually the, the number one thing to help you um, kind of make a diagnosis. So when you're going back to one of those questions and you're wondering, like, what's really helpful to make a diagnosis, it's where the eczema is when it first shows up, because atopic dermatitis hits these very specific locations. And one of the locations it almost never hits is the nose. So if you look at someone with atopic dermatitis on the face, they almost never have the nose affected. Um, if you ever need extra moisturizer, if your lips are like getting really dry and you're like, oh, I ran out of chapstick. Um, uh, sorry, that's a brand. If you ran out of um, stuff to put on your lips, um, you can take your finger and just rub the si I'm rubbing the side of my nose just for the tape. Um, you can rub the side of your nose, and you have oil there all the time. And because you have something that always has oil, it will almost never have atopic dermatitis. And that's a really helpful clinical pearl because you'll see kids who have horrible irritant dermatitis or horrible allergic contact dermatitis or something else that's happening. If they have the nose spared, it's a much more um, typical sign of atopic dermatitis. All right, and then this is kind of what the pathophysiology was if you look back in 2011. It was you have dry skin from a filaggrin mutation, the dry skin gets cracked, allergens that the body normally wasn't seeing are irritating or potentially causing allergy within the skin. You have dendritic cells which present to the immune system and the immune system creates kind of an excess inflammation. And then this slide has turned into this slide as of 2015 and actually it's even worse or better than this now. Um, and if you look on here, what this is, is a tremendous amount of your inflammatory system is actually activated with atopic dermatitis. So although the primary event is probably this really dry skin, you now have targets that are throughout the system um, of uh, the inflammatory response that can be targeted uh, for treating atopic dermatitis. So you'll see some things in here. Um, this slide was actually made, I think, even before dupilumab was actually approved. Um, and you've got a lot of things on here that uh, um, will hopefully be uh, improving uh, eczema therapy in the future. You've got JAK inhibitors that are in here and a premolas uh, that are kind of ideas for the future. Okay, and then to get back to the idea that inflammatory responses actually do cause eczema, TSLP um, is a uh, prime kind of um, uh, um, uh, activator of your TH2 response, and there are people who actually have mutated TSLP. And if you have mutations in TSLP, you have a population that actually doesn't get nearly as much atopic dermatitis. And that's a really nice kind of in vivo proof that if you have an inflammatory um, cascade that's kind of disrupted because you have a mutation and you don't actually have um, that signaling that you get less antigen presentation, you get less atopic dermatitis. Um, this is the coolest thing for kind of uh, um, basically making a massive difference in a family, and it is the most cost-effective thing possible. So if you have um, uh, the kind of paradigm of atopic dermatitis as a broken skin barrier and then an inflammatory um, response that happens from a broken skin barrier, if you look on the left side of your slide, you see the broken skin barrier. If you look on the right side, you've got a stratum corneum that's nice and intact. You've got filaggrin in there. Um, you have moisturizer that's in your, in your skin. Um, and the dendritic cell is just kind of like sitting there and it doesn't see the outside world. Um, and uh, so um, Eric Simpson was the first group to actually do this. And they essentially took 120 kids and they randomized them essentially to being moisturized or not within the first few weeks of life um, for the first six months. And what they found was as long as you start moisturizing early before the skin barrier ever really gets broken, which in my mind in practice is once you start bathing children, you're breaking the skin barrier. So if you look a thousand years ago, no one was taking a soap and like soaking kids in it and getting all of the oil off of them because that probably sounds like a terrible idea. You probably need all that stuff that your body puts there on purpose. Um, but when we bathe people, you know, when the umbilical cord falls off, you start bathing people, you should start 
start moisturizing them if they're at risk for atopic dermatitis. And what they found was it didn't matter what moisturizer they used. They used sunflower seed oil, if you're, you're like, you know, granola families, um, mineral oil, uh, lanolin petrolatum, you can probably name what that moisturizer is. I'm not going to say the brand. Um, emollient cream, it didn't matter. Um, what they did was they ended up reducing the rate of, um, or the incidence of um, uh, atopic dermatitis by about 50%. If you just think about that out loud, you've got children who should have gotten an extremely expensive, extremely challenging disease that causes tremendous family strife, and you pay for like a dollar of petrolatum for a month, and you prevented that disease from ever happening. There is no more cost-effective therapy that I can possibly imagine than moisturizing kids really early to potentially prevent them from ever getting atopic dermatitis. Um, so what I generally tell families is like the first kid comes in and they're like, yeah, okay, we're gonna try to take care of this kid, but this kid's kind of the ship has sailed. Um, we'll do our best, but the next kid, you have a chance of actually preventing their atopic dermatitis. Um, and so please start moisturizing them early to potentially prevent them. It's not perfect, but it is tremendously cost effective. Um, so this is the atopic dermatitis step ladder, and it, it's kind of a, a, a lengthy slide, and it's got a lot of information in there. Um, but essentially, uh, um, what it talks about is using non-soap cleansers. Anyone want to know what a non-soap cleanser is? It's like, it's a total misnomer, right? You're like, how can you wash your skin if it's not a soap? It turns out that, that if the soap is just at a lower concentration, you end up calling, being able to call it a syndet. So if you actually look at the soap or the surfactant within non-soap cleansers, it's often the third or fourth or fifth ingredient after a lot of other stuff. And so they're, they're not that they don't have soaps in them, it's just that they have them at much lower concentrations so they get to call themselves other things. So it makes sense to not take the oil off your skin by using less soap and then put the oil back on the skin by using thick moisturizer, which is really the hallmark of, of treating everyone with atopic dermatitis, and then avoiding obvious triggers. So if you have someone who's in really rough clothing, if you have someone um, who is sensitive to temperature changes, if you have really dry humidity in the house, you know, wintertime often brings out more eczema because you turn on the heat, and when the heat comes on, all the humidity goes down and people get dry and itchy. Um, so that's kind of your basic management. And then for mild atopic dermatitis, um, you, we tend to add things like uh, using some topical uh, steroids for inflamed skin. Um, and then uh, um, you can consider using a topical calcineurin inhibitor or crisoboral. Um, and then bleach baths have been effective not only in actually decreasing staph colonization of the skin, it's actually been shown that the staph colonization doesn't even really go down that much. But what it probably does is it's probably anti-inflammatory also. Um, and the anti-inflammatory effect of dilute bleach baths, um, uh, it can be very helpful. Um, you do want to help families kind of find the right bleach. I don't know, has anyone tried to buy bleach lately? So like the only bleach that's out there is like triple concentrated lemon fresh, like you know something that smells amazing. To get like regular plain bleach with nothing in it is actually the hardest thing to find. So you don't want double concentrated, you don't want splashless, you don't want lemon scented or watermelon or whatever. Um, you wanna get regular plain, no frills bleach um, and it is actually pretty hard to find. Um, and then again, you kind of have trigger avoidance and then you use topical steroids. Once you get into moderate and severe atopic dermatitis, these are the kids where you might be getting, or the adults, where you might be getting them better with topical steroids, but you have to have a maintenance plan. And what you hope is the maintenance plan is just moisturizer and kind of using gentle soap and, and moisturizing enough. But for most people, they need some topical therapy as a maintenance plan. So um, if in maintenance is, I think, where we fall down in atopic dermatitis, and it's especially where non-dermatology practitioners fall down. If you go to your primary care doctor, they will often give you something like, you know, triamcinolone or a topical steroid, but they won't tell you what to do after a week or two. You'd never take an asthma patient and be like, here's your, your um, you know, flare plan but we're not going to give you a maintenance plan. And in atopic dermatitis, there hasn't been nearly enough concentration on what the maintenance plan is. So maintenance plans um, in here uh, that are options, using low potency steroids um, uh, as a few days a week, using medium potency steroids on the body or arms and legs a few days a week, um, using uh, uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors, pomicrolimus or tacrolimus, or using crisoboral. And I kind of present it to families as you can usually take the topical steroid that cleared you and then use it a little bit less um, or mix it with moisturizer a few days a week and that will often maintain things or you can take uh, non-steroid medication and use that more consistently on areas that are most likely to flare. The only issue with that is that you often have small tubes, they'll give you 60 grams for a month or something like that, so you have to kind of aim for the places that are the most likely to flare, 
but it makes sense to use something as a preventative because once the inflammatory cascade starts, you've already gotten the cyclone to kind of like completely explode. Um, one of our PAs actually came up with a really nice analogy, which I'm sure is an analogy you guys have all thought of, but it's like a wildfire. So if you put out a wildfire mostly, but there are still embers, then it's going to come right back um, versus if you actually put it out completely and treat for a few days after it's gone, and then you actually like sprayed water on it every day, it is never coming back or it's going to be much harder for it to come back. And using things like TCIs and chrysoboral helps you to kind of prevent things from coming back. Um, and then uh, in terms of um, severe atopic dermatitis, this is where you start talking about systemic therapy. And I, from my standpoint, I don't think that you have to go super far before you end up with systemic therapy. You're going to have people who come into the office who have severe atopic dermatitis. You're going to give them a chance with topical steroids. You're going to give them a, a non-steroid as a maintenance potentially for Saboral or, or TCIs. Um, and if in a few weeks they're clearly showing that they can't stay off of you know, potent topical steroids for more than a day or two, I think that it's much easier to jump to systemic therapy than we used to, to um, because we have options um, uh, such as dupilumab, which are, are options that are not nearly as immunosuppressing. Um, in children, we use a lot, this is totally off-label, um, but in children, we, use, uh, we have to f have used something, and, and we do use dupilumab off-label. We also use the immunosuppressants off-label. My personal take is to use methotrexate as my first line off-label uh, off medication. The reason for that is because the JIA patients or the arthritis patients, um, the ONC patients, methotrexate is used a ton in children, and it actually has a really long safety data. Um, and so if I personally have a, you know, two or three year old, this is not what you should be doing you know, all the time. But if you have someone who's two or three who has really severe atopic dermatitis and you need to shut it down, um, from, my, from, me, from my standpoint, I think methotrexate is the safer drug. Cyclosporin makes you feel lousy, although it works very, very quickly. Um, and it's a lot of lab work. Um, and I'll get to that kind of later on. So questions in general about this, it's kind of like basic is moisturizing, using gentle soaps, using topical steroids, making sure that they have a maintenance plan, whether that's a little bit of topical steroid or using a non-steroid. Parents will be happy about the idea of a non-steroid. They are freaked out by steroids. I'll show you that in a second. And then making sure you are kind of transitioning when you need to. Yeah, nice. All right, so fix the barrier. Gentle skin cleansers, we talked about this. Limiting bathing, helping reestablish the um, epidermis, and then turning down inflammation. That's just a simple way to kind of talk about what the, what the kind of pathway is. Um, this is just a little bit of data on petrolatum. Uh, basically, what this shows is that if you have atopic dermatitis skin, uh, if you have a control um, and you put control on there versus petrolatum, you end up with spongiosis. Petrolatum takes some of the spongiosis away. It increases loroquine and filaggrin uh, expression, um, both of which help atopic skin. So there is some benefit to just straight up petrolatum. When people say it's not a moisturizer, fine, but it's good in, um, at helping atopic dermatitis when you put it on the skin. So I think that's pretty much the same thing. Um, this is phobia of topical steroids and calcineurin inhibitors. Essentially, if you look, there's something between a 30 and 70 percent of the population is scared of, of topical steroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors. The black box warnings on pomicrolimus and tacrolimus have been really annoying over time. Um, I generally, I use these drugs all the time uh, in sensitive skin areas, um, but uh, if you have um, medications without black box warnings, it would be nicer. Um, this is just a Google result. You talked about Google and what patients are seeing. This is 150 million results within 0.64 seconds for red skin syndrome, um, which is what people on the atopic dermatitis blogs are Googling all the time. Whether you believe or don't believe in this red skin syndrome, which is topical steroid addiction, the reality is that steroids are vasoconstrictors. If you use steroids for really long periods of time, it makes sense that if you stopped them, your skin would vasodilate. Um, and so I think this is probably overplayed but you see people like this who are completely red because they use topical steroids, and that's what your patients are seeing. Um, and then uh, treating infection is extremely important. So one of the things that I think helps you really get out of systemic drugs sometimes or get out of needing to use really potent topical steroids is looking for the staph colonization that, that's gotten to the point of being infection, looking for strep infections, making sure they don't have recurrent herpes infections, um, et cetera. And um, this is nice data to show that when you have treated atopic dermatitis, so when you take atopic dermatitis and you treat with a topical steroid, you actually bring back the person's innate immunity. So in atopic dermatitis, your innate immunity cells, which none of us learned about in um, medical school or, or PA school or wherever you went to get your education um, because it was like four minutes worth of, of medical school. But there are things called cathelicidins and defensins, which essentially just kill stuff. They don't need immunoglobulins. They don't need T cells. They don't need B cells. They just kill stuff. 
And so they kill bacteria that sits on top of your skin. When you have eczema, um, you have down regulation of something called LL37. Uh, and because of that, you get infected more easily. So kids with atopic dermatitis are actually immunosuppressed. And when you treat them with topical steroids, they become less immunosuppressed. That's another really helpful thing for parents. So when you're treating with topical steroids, they're like, aren't they going to get infected? It's actually the opposite. If you can re repair the skin barrier, their, their risk of infection is actually lower. Um, so this is, you know, the classic kid who comes in and they have a terrible infection on their skin. You could look at this and tell me that you can guess what it probably is, but I'll tell you that this kid had HSV PCR out of his skin and grew staph and strep. So I think that if you're going to reach for a systemic drug, if you can do it, you should culture people to know for sure what you're treating. In our area, there's a lot of resistant staph aureus, um, but this child started with atopic dermatitis, got eczema repeticum on top of it, and then that got staph strep infected. You can't necessarily look at people and guess what they're actually got um, anymore. How do people get atopic dermatitis? It's so hard when you're being taped because the jokes are so much less fun. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> How do people get atopic dermatitis with herpes on top of it? Um, so uh, parents um, feel really badly for their really sleeping, sleep-deprived child. They have a fever. They feel terrible. Um, and the first thing that they do is they end up kissing them. Their cold sore that they've had a million times over the last 50 years has never caused a problem. But if you have immunosuppressed skin, your cold sore turns into a disaster really quickly. It's usually grandparents, sorry, um, and grandparents. <laughs> Like, keep your grandparents with herpes away from the chids with atopic dermatitis. <laughs> is what it is. Sounds obvious when you say it out loud. Um, a six-month-old, uh, this is another one that you should know that you've probably all seen. Uh, but basically, this is atopic dermatitis that gets something that's very vesicular. This is not a um, poll everywhere question, but very vesicular. You look at it and you say, you should have a staph infection. You should have a strep infection. You should have a herpes infection. It's all negative. And this is enterovirus or eczema coxsackium. So enterovirus, or hand, foot, and mouth disease, um, uh, really loves eczema. You get viremic with it, and, and the viremia with the enterovirus finds anything that's inflamed. When you're one years old and you're like crawling around on your hands and your feet and you're like pooping in a diaper, it's your hands, foot, mouth, and butt that get inflamed. When you have eczema, it's all of your eczema that's inflamed. So the virus just goes to anything that's inflamed and it finds the eczema because it's inflamed skin, um, kind of kebnerizing the eczema essentially. Um, it looks like it should be a herpes infection, but if the key is if you actually look at the palms and soles, you'll see the kind of classic hand, foot, and mouth. Um, it is a little weird because the hand, foot, and mouth version that actually does this is usually enterovirus A6, uh, which is new to this country. Um, it came over um, about six or seven years ago. Um, and essentially, uh, the places it actually hits the least are the hands, the feet, and the mouth. It's like an enterovirus that loves eczema, but there'll only be a little bit in the hands, the feet, and the mouth. It's not like classic hand, foot, and mouth. It probably needs a new name, like eczema coxsackium. Cool. All right, so hand, foot, mouth, and butt, um, and I just kind of said all of those things. Um, again, treatment of atopic dermatitis, make sure that you're getting rid of the staph infection. Uh, the other um, evil thing about staph aureus is it actually inactivates topical steroids, so the actual bacteria will make your topical steroids work less well. If you're finding they're not working very well, dilute bleach baths, some antibiotics if they have an actual infection, um, trying to decolonize them, um, these things can all help a lot. All right, so foods and atopic dermatitis. This is a much easier conversation for a dermatology group, but um, foods and atopic dermatitis are not tightly correlated. So just to kind of give you the, the general spiel on this, um, if you have a child who's four, five, six months old and they go to their pediatrician and they have bad atopic dermatitis, one of the first things they usually do is switch them to formula that doesn't have anything in it. Has anyone ever tasted elemental formula? Okay, so elemental formula is all the elements that food gets broken down into. It's like it's an amino acid-based formula. If you eat food and your stomach and your duodenum process it into a bunch of amino acids and then you puke it back up and you put it in a can, that's elemental formula, and it tastes just like that, okay? So now you have a super itchy, super uncomfortable child who wasn't given any topical steroids but was given vomit to eat for lunch, and it's just terrible. Um, it's just mean, honestly. Uh, and the other problem is that if you have bad atopic dermatitis, um, there, uh, and in general, there is a high false positive rate for skin prick testing. So you have someone who's atopic, they're really itchy, they go to the pediatrician, they do a bunch of blood tests, they find that you have a positive to like, you know, 17 different things. Mom says, I've never even eaten any of those things and I'm breastfeeding. And they're like, whatever, it's causing your eczema. It becomes this like self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so the reality is um, very important to make sure that your allergist is kind of helping to weed through these for the family 
families uh, because there is a very high false positive rate. Um, this uh, is just kind of gut microbiome and atopic diseases. Uh, essentially shows that the more stuff you're exposed to, the less likely you are to become allergic. So it, uh, it turns out that vaginal deliveries are the way we were like designed to be made. So if you have a vaginal delivery, you get colonized with mom's bacteria, and you end up getting the correct bacteria in your gut, and you have much less atopy. If you have a cesarean section, you have higher atopy. Um, if you have um, uh, a dishwasher, you have higher atopy because you're, you're really, really bad at cleaning dishes, at least I am, and dishwashers are really good at cleaning dishes. And once you clean all the old food off of everything, they're not being exposed to nearly as many allergens and not being cross-exposed between different families um, or family members, and you get um, more atopic diseases. Um, and again, uh, EE or uh, eosinophilic esophagitis has also been associated with cesarean sections. So the cleaner you are in general, the more atopic diseases that you have. If you look at the cleanest societies in the world, they have a high rates of atopic dermatitis. If you look at children who are born on a farm with a dog, they have the lowest rates of atopic dermatitis. So the more we do to make our environment as sterile as possible, the worse it gets. Yeah. Um, this is just introducing peanuts just because this is partially our responsibility. Um, this is Bamba, in case you haven't seen this story. So essentially, there was a, um, a person giving a talk uh, in Israel about lamenting about how much peanut allergy there is. Uh, and all of the Israeli allergists were like, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't have peanut allergy. And they were like, yes, you do. And he was like, no, you don't. Um, and it went back and forth. And it turns out that they don't have that much peanut allergy. And the reason they don't have that much peanut allergy is because the chew toy that like gets dissolved immediately in the mouth in Israel is called Bamba, and it's made of peanuts. Um, and so their kids are getting exposed super early, and they become much less allergic. So this is a giant New England Journal tr um, uh, trial, which basically showed that if you give peanuts earlier versus withholding peanuts, which is what we always used to tell people, first of all, don't give people a peanut, OK? If you give a six-month-old a peanut, they're just going to die. So don't do that. Um, they will choke. But like, you know, peanut butter on something, bomba, et cetera, like give them something they're not going to choke on. Um, but essentially what they showed was that they randomized people to peanut avoidance versus getting some peanut. The peanut avoidant group had a 17% rate of peanut allergy. And this is a high risk group. So like going into it, they had a family history or whatever. Um, but the reality is all the things we've been telling people for a long time, like having like the peanut avoidance and like don't give it till two was probably causing a lot of the peanut allergy. So what you're supposed to do is if you have moderate or severe atopic dermatitis, you're supposed to have an allergist kind of consider whether to kind of do food testing first and then um, potentially feed them peanuts. Um, again, kind of have your allergist involved if you have questions. Um, so finding the root cause of eczema, there's not always a root cause. Don't drive, your, drive yourself crazy. But humidity changes can affect the barrier. You can have infection. You can have contact allergies. You can have environmental allergies, nutrition, immunodeficiency. But the biggest one really is noncompliance and running out of the medicine. That's going to be the most major thing that happens to our patients. Um, again, this is kind of flare plan and, and maintenance plan that we've already talked about. The bottom line is you need a maintenance plan when you have um, moderate, severe atopic dermatitis. Um, and even with mild, you need at least just good skin care, but you might need a, a maintenance medication also. Um, so what are your non-steroids? Your non-steroids at this point are pomicrolimus, tacrolimus. Um, they both have a black box warning on them, which is frustrating. The pomicrolimus, um, this is actually from a few years ago now. Um, they followed something called the PEER study, and tacrolimus has a similar study where they followed um, uh, thousands of patient years of using the medications and found no increased risk in the things that are on the black box warning. So these black box warnings are probably not um, uh, going to be super relevant, uh, and that's based off of a lot of data from the FDA. Um, patient, parents like when you have something that's not a steroid, and they like when you have something that not not, doesn't have a black box warning. Crisaborol or crisaborol at this point is, is our drug for that. Um, it is a PDE4 inhibitor. Just to give you the answer to one of the other questions that was kind of hard, it actually turns out down IL-2 signaling. So if you look at that question, IL-4 and 13 are turned down by dupilumab, whereas IL-2 is actually turned down by crisoboral. IL-2 is interesting because it's actually a Th1 cytokine, uh, so you're kind of targeting a different part of the immune system. Um, so potentially this is like an adjunct to other parts of, the, of your therapeutic um, uh, armamentarium. Um, again, nice thing is it's not a steroid. It has very few limitations. You can use it down to the age of two. Hopefully at some point um, uh, there'll be trials to kind of 
um, that are uh, um, talked about where you can use it lower. Um, the one issue that we have is that when you put it on to open skin or really inflamed skin, I tend to find that there um, is some irritation with that. I think it's really helpful for hands and feet and kind of thicker skin areas, arms, legs. Um, the face, it's a little bit harder to tolerate in some of those patients. Um, but it's really, what I tend to do is clear someone with a topical steroid and then use this as a maintenance plan. Yeah. Um, this is just Crisaverol data showing that you get lower um, uh, um, itch scores as well as uh, um, atopic dermatitis scores with crisabarol. Their vehicle was actually very potent also, which is interesting, um, but uh, it's still way outbeat the vehicle. So major flares, kind of once you've gotten through topical management, the, the thing that I do for major flares is I always give people a chance to wet wrap and get better. If you can wet wrap, you can avoid someone a systemic drug potentially, and if you can just calm people down enough, you kind of soak them in a bathtub, you soak and smear them with a, with a low to mid-potency topical steroid. If they're an adult, you know, you might use a mid to um, uh, stronger steroid. Um, and you do it for a few days in a row, and then you maybe do it once or twice a week as maintenance, depending on how strong you're using. Um, and, and really, oral steroids should not be used consistently. They lead to more and more and more um, oral steroids, and people can get really addicted to them. Um, wet wrap therapy shows its score ad decrease from 50 to 15, which is really impressive. And this is with using a cheap, um, uh, you know, low to mid potency topical steroid uh, for very short periods of time, and is very effective. So this is what I use as my steroids, uh, as my um, uh, uh, kind of get out of a systemic free card. And then these are your systemic options. I didn't put everything on here. We don't use a whole lot of mycophenolate um, in children. Um, I love the fact that we now have an atopic dermatitis targeted drug, which is dupilumab, which is an IL-413 receptor um, alpha antagonist. Um, and, uh, and as I said before, the reason that I use methotrexate as my first line, not if I can't get dupilumab or if there's some reason not to use it, um, is because it's less blood work. Um, and uh, if you look at cyclosporin, the amount of blood work that you need for cyclosporin generally is higher. You also can't people, keep people on cyclosporin for really long periods of time because you worry about renal disease. There's some data for using like weekend cyclosporin, but um, um, if you need to use something consistently, I think methotrexate you can keep on for longer. This is all off-label except for dupilumab, which is um, in over 12. And then I think light therapy actually does work. It's just a matter of kind of getting them to a light box. So it's hard to come in a couple times a week. Um, it's very uh, time consuming, um, especially in patients who have some skin of color where their risk of burning in the light box is lower. Um, I, I think that it's a nice um, option, um, although you can use it for anyone. And then what's new? So this is abracitinib. Somebody was asking about JAK inhibitors. Um, this is uh, an oral JAK1 inhibitor, uh, which just went through phase two. Uh, and showed um, a really impressive uh, decrease in IGAs, which is the Investor Global Initiative. Um, and essentially, um, it uh, um, um, way outbeat placebo, and it also had a uh, dose-dependent response. So the higher the dose of the medication, it tended to work better, um, which shows um, um, some significant uh, um, data for it. So hopefully, over time, we'll have more medications. It would be nice to have an oral option um, as a systemic drug. Um, this is just uh, in case you ever wondered if there was any methotrexate data, because I think generally when we all learned about atopic dermatitis, we learned about cyclosporin as the first-line drug. I'm not saying it's not the first-line drug. I would just say kind of remember methotrexate, because it's a little easier drug to use, especially in children. Um, but we found that, our, that um, uh, methotrexate was very effective, um, and 75% of them had a, a more than 50% improvement in our practice. Um, and we've uh, um, generally used that as first line. If you need to shut ex uh, atopic dermatitis down really, really quickly, cyclosporin is um, probably a faster drug. It's just you have to transition to something over time, uh, and you can't keep it on forever. Um, dupilumab is an IL-413 receptor antagonist uh, and has shown, as you know, um, really impressive um, decreases in easy scores as well as itch. Uh, and um, we've used this a lot in children. I've used it off-label below, below the age of 12 and had really good benefit with it. The one thing that I didn't put in here is, is the caveat of having a few patients get this kind of facial redness. Have people had this happen? So when you use dupilumab, you can get this facial redness, which is probably malassezia overgrowth. Um, and uh, um, I've had to use systemic antifungals like fluconazole to kind of get around the, um, the malassezia that, that's uh, newly happened over the last couple of months. Uh, and then again, getting back to this, there's going to be much more that's going to come out. Hopefully you'll sit in a bunch of atopic dermatitis CME talks in the next five years and you'll be like, <laughs> we used to use topical steroids like silly us um, because there are much better drugs that are out there, um, hopefully. Um, 
This is kind of why JAK inhibitors may be really effective. If you look at JAK signaling, um, the IL-4 receptor antagon uh, um, alpha, uh, the IL-4 receptor alpha um, receptor is essentially signals through JAK. Um, IL-31 signals through JAK, and IL-31 is your itch cytokine. So this is one of the ones that causes tremendous itch. Also signals through JAK. Um, and uh, so JAK may be kind of the, one of the final pathways for anti-inflammation. Anti um, these are the JAK inhibitors that are kind of in, in um, publication or in uh, um, trials, and they target lots of different parts. So there's JAK1 and 2, two and 3. Um, there's Tyke. There's going to be a lot more that comes out with this. Um, this is topical JAK inhibitors. This slide is actually a little bit difficult to read. I'm not sure why they published it this way. But what it looks like is like by week 12, everything was equal. That's actually not what this means. So essentially, if you look at this, at week 8, everyone was switched over to a JAK inhibitor. So if you look at week 8, you just have vehicle. Then, you know, 27% of people had, had gotten a benefit of their easy score. Um, whereas uh, if you look at week 8, which is the green bars, and you have all the way on the right the 1.5% ruxolitinib, 79% of people had reached an, um, or had a significant decrease in their easy scores. And then if you look at the blue bars, that's everyone got transitioned on to ruxolitinib, and then everyone got the benefit no matter what you started with. So I, I think topical JAK inhibitors, I hope, are more of a niche that we can use more easily because I, I, I think I'd worry a lot less about them. Yeah. Um, all right, so summary, atopic dermatitis is common, really severe emotional distress. We have many more options than we used to, and we're about to have many more options than this. Um, and I think that, that it's really important to know what's out there um, because this is extraordinarily um, uh, distressing for families. There is a therapeutic ladder. With mild disease, you're using mostly emollients and topical steroids and some topical um, crisaborol uh, or TCIs as maintenance. And then as you get higher up, you need to consider systemic therapy um, at the higher level. Levels. And again, with new therapies, hopefully this will be a much more um, uh, kind of exciting talk in five years when we'll have like 10 different things to talk about. I think the best analogy is if you look 15 years ago, for those of you who are practicing 15 years ago, I was in residency and for um, psoriasis, it was like, we have a systemic drug. That's not methotrexate and cyclosporin. And everyone was super excited about like Amaviv or whatever it was, Reptiva. Um, and the reality is now in psoriasis, like every day there's a new systemic drug. You're like, you wake up one day and you're like, there's another systemic drug for psoriasis. And they got like 110% clearance, and it's amazing. Um, and atopic dermatitis is, is in the kind of 10-year lag of that, where hopefully we will have drugs that do that um, more and more and more. So thank you guys very much for your attention. All right, it's time for the Q&A session. We have some good questions that people typed in. Um, First question, how do you instruct people on how to do a wet wrap? Uh, there are some uh, simple ways and some more complicated ways. The simplest thing that I um, like to tell people to do is to go and get some um, cotton pajamas that are slightly too small. So essentially, um, they go to you know their local store and they get long johns that are white, ideally, so there's not a lot of dye to them. And then they're a little snug fitting. Uh, they uh, sit in a bathtub for five or 10 minutes of kind of warm water, and then they get out and immediately apply the medicine all over. Um, or if they want to, they can actually apply just moisturizer all over, and either one is fine. The medicine's obviously gonna work better if you have some topical steroids. Um, and then essentially, uh, they put on the damp cotton pajamas, so they get them a little bit wet in the water. Uh, they put them on, and they leave them on for about an hour and a half or two. Kids don't usually tolerate leaving them on overnight or leaving them on longer than that. A, they can stick to their skin if they're especially open. Um, and B, it just kind of gets wet and um, irritating to them. Uh, so they tend to kind of um, leave it on a little less long. The other way of wet wrapping is to get fancy kind of wet wrapping clothing. So they make, you know, eczema clothing, which is fancier, or to do things like, you know, wrapping them with things like Curlix, which we'll do when kids are an inpatient. Um, but it's probably not reasonable to ask the families to do that at home. Um, and then, uh, what's my face? Yeah, so um, the Medicaid questions are really good questions. So most of my patients or many of my patients are also on Medicaid. So the question was, when people are on Medicaid, are any of these um, medicines available to patients? We've actually, in Pennsylvania, at least had a fairly good um, uh, track record of being able to get medicines. What usually happens is that in order to get things like topical crisaborol, they've, they've often um, had to use topical tacrolimus or topical pimicrolimus, but one of those is usually on, on the formularies, at least around here. Um, and then dupilumab, we've actually had good success getting also. You know, we get these letters back that say, 
we want you to try XYZ immunosuppressing medication, you know, cyclosporin, methotrexate, it's actually really easy to write a letter back in children over 12 and say, listen, those are off-label, non-FDA approved for atopic dermatitis medications, and we want to use dupilumab, which is an on-label FDA approved medication, or we want to use crisabarol in a child over two years old, which is on-label and FDA approved. Um, so you're, you know, you're withholding the FDA approved medication while approving the non-FDA approved medication. Really, the only reason to do that is cost, and that's not appropriate for the care of the patient. So that, that argument has helped us out a lot. Um, the, the new drugs are expensive. All new drugs, uh, when they come out, they're priced um, in uh, um, generally at the higher end. Um, and certainly the injectable new drugs are, are like um, most other biologics where they are expensive. But the, the savings to the healthcare system are, are really um, dramatic uh, when you um, count people's missed days from work, missed days from school, the not sleeping at night, the disruption of the family, the potential hospitalizations, the antibiotics and other topical medicines that they might be avoiding. Um, I think these medications become cost effective really quickly. Um, and then from crisabarol and to, uh, pimicrolimus and tacrolimus' um, standpoint, you know, pimicrolimus um, and tacrolimus are not new, but crisabarol is newer. If you can prevent atopic dermatitis flares um, and not use topical steroids, um, I think that there are a lot of families who definitely appreciate that, and there is some cost savings to um, uh, not having them flare. And if, and if they're chronically relying on topical steroids, which can eventually thin out the skin, uh, then it's nice to have something that they're not as reliant on. The reality is that we use mostly topical steroids um, for flares of atopic dermatitis, and, and we'll use kind of, you know, once or twice weekly for maintenance, or we'll mix it with moisturizer. But having things that are non-steroids are, are very helpful, A, for steroid-phobic parents, um, but also for children who are going to need more chronic therapy. Um, and, you know, preventing uh, the risks of topical steroids is very helpful. Um, how much does how much do different types of soaps play a role in the maintenance phase? So, I, I mean, what I generally tell people about soaps is that soaps, essentially, you're trying to find the soap that causes the least harm. So, um, there are soaps that have things like, you know, sodium hypochlorate in them, which can help to kill bacteria, um, uh, which can be kind of beneficial. But most of the soaps, the, the benefit of them from an atopic dermatitis standpoint is they've actually taken out a lot of the soap. So essentially, the, the actual soap or surfactant part of it will be down on the list, and they're technically then called syndets. Uh, and so you're trying to find the ones that have the fewest allergens, the fewest irritants, um, and so it's not really the soap is helping people. And we, we find people who say, oh, I was told to use XYZ soap and I scrubbed my child down with it twice a day for a week and it didn't do anything. Well, that's not going to do anything. The soap is not necessarily beneficial. It's just trying to find a soap that, that doesn't kind of strip off any of the natural ceramides that are on there. Um, do children with atopic dermatitis have more behavioral problems, screaming fits, et cetera? Absolutely. Uh, so there's now a lot of emerging data on um, things like um, attention deficits and sleeping issues and depression going along with a lot of systemic diseases, but but atopic dermatitis or a lot of cutaneous diseases and atopic dermatitis is not an exception. Um, and I, I think that's where us being able to offer people therapies that are effective even when they might have some potential side effects, the risk of not treating them is very high um, when you have children who haven't slept and parents who haven't slept. And so, you know, although we don't want to give children systemic drugs and we don't want to, you know, give them the risks of, of using long-term medications, uh, the reality is it's really important to make sure that they sleep and they can do well in school and that they can function normally, both socially and emotionally. Um, so uh, really important to address that with families. I think once you ask, you'll find a floodgate of people. And I don't, I'm not trying to be people's psychiatrist. I'm not trying to, you know, address their behavioral needs myself, but I'm trying to be the person who identifies them so that then I can say, you know, it's really important that you talk to your primary care doctor and um, figure out who can help you in, from a behavioral health standpoint. And, and also just acknowledging and saying, you know, we understand that you're going through a lot with this atopic dermatitis, and we want to, um, we want to make sure that you're um, as comfortable as possible. Um, and that the atopic dermatitis isn't getting in the way of, of the rest of your life. Um, have you ever seen or do you think it's possible two unrelated adults who may have had a type of scabies with subsequent very heavy repeated treatments, topical and oral, have atopic dermatitis develop in both? 
but present, this is a very specific question, but present slightly differently after the scabies. Um, so can you get atopic dermatitis from scabies therapy? Uh, pathophysiologically, probably not. You probably have to have some background um, uh, risk factors for developing atopic dermatitis, but can you irritate the skin of atopic dermatitis by putting permethrin all over? I do find that that families will say that the permethrin burns and stings on children with atopic dermatitis or people with atopic dermatitis, and so I, I would kind of screen them, um, uh, you know, after they treat with for scabies, making sure that they're going back to moisturizing and doing all the gentle things, et cetera. Um, and uh, making sure that that's uh, um, really, uh, they're taking good care of their skin. Uh, next question, what is the incidence of fungal infection associated with dupilumab? It's a really interesting question that I don't think we fully know the answer to, but um, the facial dermatitis that you can get in dupilumab, which there have now been a, several reports of and we've now seen in children a few times, um, it's been pubertal children in our, in our experience anecdotally, um, and so, what I think is probably happening is you have malassezia that is on the face naturally, and then somehow dupilumab is turning down the body's own response to it or is or is shifting the response so that you get an overreaction to the malassezia in kind of a seborrheic pattern. Um, and so I think that that's not, uh, I think that's going to be found more and more as people are looking for it. The, the people with kind of the red face a few months after starting dupilumab, you want to consider whether that is um, a malassezia infection, and, and again, off-label anecdotally, um, there have been reports of using uh, um, azoles uh, orally. So I, I've used fluconazole a few times and had good success with getting that red skin, kind of inflamed face look um, to get better. And it looks like eczema. It's kind of a scaling background pink look, but the rest of their skin is in perfect shape uh, or usually way better. So when it's really specifically localized to the face, I do I do think that um, fungal infections are probably playing a role, um, not necessarily candida or any of the typical fungi, but really malassezia. Um, how do you feel about creams versus ointments for topical steroids? I actually feel really strongly about this subject. So doing a lot of allergic contact dermatitis and also dealing with a lot of children, I, I really strongly prefer ointments. Um, and the reason for that is that they generally have fewer ingredients. So if you look at the ingredients list in like triamcinolone 0.1% ointment and triamcinolone 0.1% cream, often there are other things in the cream that kid, people can get allergic to. And then the other thing is that when you put an ointment on, you don't burn, whereas when you put a cream on, people tend to stay at stings. So, you know, petroleum jelly is, or, you know, petrolatum is usually the base of ointments, and because of that, um, they shouldn't sting when they go on the skin unless the actual, you know, medication is stinging, whereas creams tend to sting, and, and kids um, and often adults will refuse to use uh, creams if they, um, if they, uh, they burn. This flip side of that is that ointments are greasy, and older kids and you know young adults hate them and so they would rather have a little bit of burning and just use the cream and and that's fine too um so uh if if someone is 12 and it's going to be a choice between them using something that's a cream and not using anything at all um I'd much rather give them a cream and have them actually use it so it's a little bit of a kind of a, a, a um negotiation with the parent but ideally use ointments and especially in little kids definitely use ointments so that um they uh um, don't have that burning sensation because parents will give up on steroids very quickly if they feel like they're burning. Um, all right, so what role do antihistamines play in atopic dermatitis? If you actually look at the atopic dermatitis guidelines, antihistamines like barely make it on there, and they're they're really an adjunct, and they're not they're not really a standard of care core part of the treatment of atopic dermatitis, and that's because atopic dermatitis, as as we saw before, is really not a histamine disease. So do histamines play some role in some patients? Sure. So, so you know, the kids who have a lot of environmental allergies or they're cat allergic or dust mite and they're getting runny nose and itching just because they're around their environmental allergy, I think antihistamines play a role there. And I, I generally use non-sedating antihistamines like cetirizine or um, loratadine. But if you use them standardly, you just downregulate all those histamine receptors um, and the medications kind of work less and less well. So I, I like um, to tell parents, you know, 
can we use diphenhydramine or hydroxyzine? Sure, but what we're not doing is we're not really targeting the eczema. We're not, you know, magically making their eczema better. What we're really doing is giving them a good night's sleep um, every once in a while. But if you do it all the time, they're going to get used to it, and it's not going to work very well anymore. And then it's also really important to um, uh, consider not using, uh, or I do not use antihistamines under the age of six months. Um, and the reason for that is uh, because of the risk of too much sedation. So, you know, you don't want to have kids um, not be able to protect their airway or not be able to, um, if, they, if they rolled over and they got stuck, you don't want them to be too sedated. You want them to be able to, you know, cry out and um, tell their parents that they need help. Um, what moisturizer was used in the prevention study? Um, the prevention study for atopic dermatitis, there's actually three different ones, uh, and there may be more at this point, but they, they basically used all, all sorts of moisturizers. Um, petroleum jelly was used, sunflower seed oil was used, a mineral oil, petroleum jelly mixture was used, and it didn't matter. Um, so no matter what moisturizer was used, as long as it was a thick kind of typical eczema moisturizer, um, they found the same thing, which is that they could decrease the incidence of atopic dermatitis pretty impressively. Um, should you use topical steroids as just a general question? I mean, we talk about all of these new medications. The reality is that what we have now as the core of therapy is still topical steroids for most patients. And the key is kind of trying to use them as safely as possible. And one of the other questions is about striae and topical steroids. The, the people who generally form stretch marks are the people who are at an age where they're forming stretch marks. So if you look at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds who are kind of going actively through puberty or even into their teenage years, and you have, and if they're putting a topical steroid on their inner thigh or their inner arm or um, around the breast area or the abdomen where they're going to get stretch marks anyway, you can make them dramatically worse. So in those cases, in those patients, I'm, I'm much more cautious. They're also the kids who are smart enough that they realize that, um, that the topical steroids work way better than the moisturizers. So, you know, if you have a 15-year-old who realizes that they've got a tub of trimcinolone and a tub of petroleum jelly, they know the triamcinolone is what works, and they kind of get a little bit um, uh, lackadaisical, lackadaisical and they essentially just use the triamcinolone as their moisturizer. That's where you run into a lot more problems with topical steroids. So I think topical steroids are first line, um, and they, um, but having things that you can use as maintenance plans and having things that you can use for chronic um, care is where the non steroids really have a, a big role in my practice and are, um, are very helpful and then can prevent kind of any of the potential skin issues that you can get from topical steroids. Um, what about sulfate and paraben and body washes? Uh, parents at this point come in questioning just about everything, as they probably should, that's in everything. And so I kind of tell them they have to use something. Um, and if people are super granola and they want to use something that's you know, as free of everything as possible, there is some data for coconut oil. There's some data for safflower seed oil. Um, it turns out the data for olive oil shows that it's probably pro-inflammatory, so I really don't recommend olive oil. Um, but if they want to do coconut oil or safflower seed oil, as long as they're not allergic to it, um, then that's reasonable. Um, petroleum jelly, I mean, it came out of the ground. I know it's oil, and people don't like oil, but it did come out of the ground. Um, so kind of organic, probably, probably not technically organic, but uh, that kind of makes people feel better. I also like telling people the story about topical steroids, which is really, you know, as humans, we can't survive without steroids in our body every day. So, you know, we're also, again, you know, using a lot of it, but we end up putting on something that the body, you know, if, if you have someone who's got Addison's and doesn't have any steroids inside their body, that's actually not compatible um, with survival over a long period of time. So, you know, topical steroids, although not fully natural, are also something that uh, that your body knows how to process. Um, next question, uh, what do you counsel about vaccines and giving immunization? So I, I think that question is based on um, using uh, um, dupilumab. So dupilumab, essentially, you're not allowed to give live vaccines when you're on dupilumab. So I do try to have people get all of their vaccines updated. Um, before they start. So if we're starting someone who's really young, unfortunately, most of the vaccines after five or six years of age are actually not live, um, but they just want to kind of talk to their pediatrician. Um, all right. So skin care advice to patients can be frustrating when local pharmacies are full of lotions and potions that parents strongly believe in when they should be avoiding and sensitive skin. Do you have any tricks of the trade to share? 
I really like to I, I tell people um, things like, you know, poison ivy is super organic also. Um, and uh, there is some data for lavender being associated with precocious puberty. So, you know, just because it's not, you know, a prescription and it's, it's sold by the pharmacy in an aisle and it has flowers on it doesn't mean that it's like safe. So I tell people to think about what you know, using as few ingredients as they possibly can on their kid's skin and finding things that are generally fragrance and formaldehyde free. People usually look at me like I'm crazy as if anyone would put formaldehyde in anything. But as we know, as, you know, dermatology practitioners that, you know, there are formaldehyde releasers in lots and lots of things and, and it's actually hard to avoid them. Um, Someone asked about coconut oil, and I kind of addressed this. I really feel like coconut oil has some benefit. It's not super thick, so I think some people dry out after they use it. Um, but it is uh, something that is reasonable. And uh, if people are going to use coconut oil and they're going to be scared of using petroleum jelly, um, then having them use coconut oil is reasonable. There also are um, dimethicone-based moisturizers. So if parents really don't want petrolatum, um, they, can, they can find dimethicone-based moisturizers, which are, again, very thick. A lot of the diaper pastes are actually made out of dimethicone, um, and, uh, and that can be helpful. Um, and then last question is about dust mites and how they play a role. I, I think there's probably more to be known about how all environmental allergies play a role in atopic dermatitis. So, you know, we have kids who are dog or cat allergic or dust mite allergic and or the kids who flare in the summertime instead of the wintertime when they're around their ragweed and pollen. And I think generally what's happening most likely is that, you know, kids are going out, they're being exposed to their allergens and they're getting really itchy just because they're getting kind of an urticarial type response to their allergens and then they're scratching their eczema and then that makes their eczema get worse. Um, and uh, or it's possible that we'll figure out at some point that there'll be some allergic contact dermatitis that's actually happening from environmental allergens. But it's um, uh, I think there's a lot more to kind of learn about that. So we're just about out of time. Thank you everyone for your attention, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care.